I want to begin by expressing how much I am thankful for each one of you and for your encouragement and for your prayers and all the support that you have given me through the years. I know that the elders are grateful for your support as well, and we appreciate our elders very much. We are thankful for our deacons and for those that are doing the great work that they're doing, uh, even our ones that stand at the back door and greet you as they come in, and we're so thankful for them as well. We're thankful for every member here at the Central Church of Christ. We're thankful for those who want to place membership and be a part of this great work here at Central as well, and we're thankful for all of those things. And what Paul is telling us here in this particular verse is that in everything we ought to be thankful, right, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. There are a lot of things that we ought to be grateful and no doubt there are times in life that maybe we do not express our thanksgiving as often as we should. I've said it many times. I know that this week, come Thursday, is Thanksgiving Day. I know that this Thanksgiving is going to be, it's not going to be anything like any of the other Thanksgivings that we've had through the years. But we hope that you will still look at it as being a time to be thankful. But I say we ought to be thankful every day. We need to count our blessings and name them one by one every day and be thankful. So there are some things that even from my perspective that we ought to be grateful. Things that we ought to be really grateful to God for in this life. Because without those blessings, we would have no hope. So I think first of all about the love of God. The love of God is unmatched. So now again, we're talking about things that we ought to be grateful for, to be thankful for, and how grateful we ought to be for the love of God and the fact that lo His love is unrivaled, it is unmatched. But the Bible talks about that fact, that God is love, 1 John 4, 7. And that is the essence of His being. And so in Scripture, first we have the verbalization of the love of God. God has verbalized his love for each one of us. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Sometimes I think it's difficult for us to comprehend the fact that God truly loves us. Jeremiah, in the long ago, speaking of God, said, I have loved you with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31, 3. As a parent, we love our children. As grandparents, we love our grandchildren. And we will express that love even if that child has gotten into trouble. They're still your child. But you're going to love them, and you'll never really stop loving that child. But we need to understand that's really how God loves us. No matter what we do, God still loves us, and God still wants us to show our love for him. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so we need to understand how God loves us. He loves us no matter what we've done, no matter what we've said, no matter what we or where we have been. Now, that's not to say he loves us in what we do, all right? He does not endorse our lifestyle as if it's always continually in sin. He loves us, but he doesn't love what we do. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that wholeheartedly. God has always loved us. He will always love us. And to think that that love of God is expressed over and over again in the Scriptures. You know in 1 John 4 and verse 9, or verse 19, that we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. In Ephesians 2 and verse 4, Paul said, But God, who is rich in mercy, 
For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And so, to know that God loves me, and that he loves you, but he will always love us. Again, he may not like what you're doing, he may not love what you're doing, but he loves you as a person, as an individual, because why? Because you are the very crown of his creation. I think about how God had manifested and or demonstrated his love for us. First, we learned he had verbalized it, right? But he's also demonstrated that love. Someone has said that in times past that talk is cheap. There are a lot of folks that will use the word love in, in a very loose way, if you will. But when God says he loves us, when he says he loves you, he has the proof behind those words. You see, God loved you enough. He loved me enough to send his only begotten son to die in our place. We're the guilty ones. We were the ones that's that's supposed to die. But God so loved the world that he gave. Now, Think about the words of Paul in Romans 8 and verse 32 when it says that God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Now, how shall we not be with him also freely give us all things, right? That that encompasses all of us. God sent his son to die for us. Now, it's easy to love somebody that's lovable, right? Yes. Yes. It's not hard to love somebody that's always treating you right and doing right. But the Bible says that that in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He said, but God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 6 and 8. And so Jesus demonstrated his love for us no matter what. Jesus said, greater love hath not uh, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. God demonstrated his love for us when he sent his own son to die for our sins. And he backed that all up by demonstration, by the sending of his son. Again, the words of Jesus in John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that he gave. No wonder Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15 that thanks be to God for his indescribable, his unspeakable gift. That's how much God loves you and me. And that's the link that that he's gone to show how much he loves us. In 1 John 4 and verse 10, Jesus said, or John said, here in his love... Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, there's a second thing I want us to think about when we talk about being grateful to God and grateful for the love that he has toward us and that love is unmatched. I would suggest to you that we ought to be grateful to God because he is longing for us. His longing for us is unmatched. It is without equal. As a parent, we want what's best for our children, don't we? I don't know of a parent that wishes ill or harm on their children in any way. We do everything that we can to provide a surrounding that will bless them and benefit them in every way, allowing them to grow maturely Physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, because we have their best interests as heart. Now, when you talk about God, God has your best interests at heart. You may not understand that, but he does. Just like as a child. A child doesn't necessarily understand that what we as parents are doing is for their good and for their benefit. Isn't that true? Yes. I think about how God desires us to be a part of his family. Paul said that God's desire is that all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. 
The Bible also tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. In other words, they would then change their ways, right? First Peter or Second Peter three nine. You think about God and very the very fact that He wants you to be a part of His family. He wants you to have an intimate relationship with Him. First John three and verse one. John said, Behold what manner of love hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God or the children of God. Did you know that God invites us to be a part of his divine family? That's right. Think, if you will, about the words of Jesus during his earthly ministry who said, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. The words of John in John 7, or Revelation 22 and verse 17, when John said, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. You see, there's an open invitation, isn't there? An open invitation for you and me to become a part of his family. Now, Jesus said the way to become a part of his family is to be born again. John 3, 3. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, he wasn't talking about a physical birth, right? But rather a spiritual birth. And so in verse 5, he goes on to say in John 3, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so when we obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we contact the very blood of Christ. And through the blood of Christ, we are then placed within the family, the body of Christ. We are said to be members, members of the household of God, the family of God. And it's in that sphere that we enjoy all the spiritual blessings that we can read about in Scripture. And so God wants and desires you to be a part of his family. Now, there's another thing. When we talk about the longing of God... God desires, and God wants you to be a part of his future. I I don't know what your future holds when we talk about what is before us in life physically and materially, what is before us in life eternally, but God wants you and I to be a part of that, a part of the future, Well, well, the future to us. You know, God's eternal, so there's not a past, present, or future, but a future for us. Now, the Bible tells us that there is a place reserved for us called heaven. I like what Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, when he said, Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house, or in many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'd go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You see? That's wonderful. The Bible tells us that this place called heaven is incorruptible. It's undefiled. It fades not away, First Peter 1 and verse 4. God wants you to be a part of that future. He wants you to live forever in a place where there will be no more death, neither sorrow, no more pain, right? No more crying. For John said in Revelation 21, 4, that all these things have passed away. God wants you to be a part of that. And I would inject that he has promised that to every faithful child of God. Paul writes in Titus 1 and verse 2 that we live in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Did you know that? That God has promised and made a promise and that God will hold true to that very promise? I hope that you believe that. That if you'll just be faithful unto death, The promise is the crown of life. The victor's crown. The Stephanos. Some have already gone to the reward. Those who have lived for God are in the place called paradise. 
It is a place described as a place of comfort and of rest. John said, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelation 14, 13. And so to know that God longs for us is to be a part of his family, but to also be a part of his future. But then there's a third thing that when we talk about being grateful to God and how we ought to get down on our knees and express our thanksgiving to Almighty God, I would suggest to you that we ought to be thankful to God because of the life that he offers us. And by the way, the life that we're talking about is unmatched. It is without equal. In order to appreciate the life that we have, let's turn back to the book of Ecclesiastes for just a minute, if you will. And I want you to notice something very important here because in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we have a fitting summation of the great futility of living without God. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, where Solomon is the writer of Ecclesiastes. And over and over again, Solomon talks about the vanity. He talks about the futility or the futility of life. And really what he's saying is that life without God is futile. It's in vain. It's worthless. First, if you would, think about the accomplishments of Solomon in verse 1. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. In verse 12, he says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And then we talk about the achievements of Solomon. It might be the case that there's a young person in our assembly even today who might be a male, might be a female, but that one day might govern this country as the president. Maybe. We don't know. It's a very real possibility. It might be that as a parent or a grandparent, that your daughter, your granddaughter will be a senator, a congresswoman, right? It might be the case that your son will be a congressman or a senator. As we talk about our wishes and about our aspirations for our children, how we want them to achieve a lot in this life, we want them to make a name for themselves. Did you know that in our short history here, there's only been 45 presidents? What if your child were to become the president, your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter, Solomon, the son of David, was king over Israel? He was a very powerful young man. And then I think about his accolade. Look at verse 16 of Ecclesiastes 1. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. Look at Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 9. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. You see, Solomon had a reputation unrivaled, unequaled in his day. Did you remember the the Bible talked about the queen of the south, that that is the queen of, of Sheba coming from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon? And she said, the half is yet to be told. 1 Kings 10, 7. This guy was something. We talk about fame and we talk about power. This guy had it all. It was all at his fingertips. What about his possessions? Look at, chapter, uh, look at verse 4 of uh, chapter 2. He said, I made, the, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And, and I planted trees and in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I have great possessions of both great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and other provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. Look at verse 10. 
And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. So when we talk about Solomon, you're really envisioning somebody that had it all. This guy was something. That he had fame, he had fortune, he had a vast family. He's got all of these great blessings materially, right? But now in our heart of hearts, in our mind of minds, what do we typically think? That a man that has everything that, that is at, at his reach, that there isn't nothing that he has seen that he does not have. There is nothing that, that he wants that he couldn't have. He can. But what is it that we think about? Is he happy? Are they happy? Right? We think about Solomon. Do you think that Solomon was happy? Listen to his assessment of life. Drop down to look at verse 17. And this is very sobering. Verse 17. Here's what Solomon said. We talked about his achievements. We talked about his accolades. We talked about his acquisitions. Verse 17. Therefore, I hated life. What? A man that could have everything that he could ever have. Therefore, I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Did you hear that? A guy that has it all. He's got fame and fortune and family. He's got more money than he'll ever be able to spend. He's known far and wide for his wisdom. And therefore, he says, I hate life. We, we lived in Horn Lake, Mississippi for a couple years while we was attending school. And it was just a little bit south of Graceland where Elvis Presley's mansion is, is there. And B.J. Clark was preaching at South Haven, Mississippi, and just south of Memphis, a little north of us at at that time. And and B.J. talked about an incident that had happened to him while he was there preaching. And he used an illustration of a story that he had seen about an interview with Elvis Presley. And Elvis Presley said during this uh, interview to the one who was doing the interview, and and, and of course B.J.'s relating this to the church, but here's what, here's what Elvis said. Sometimes I think that I'm the most miserable person in the world. Elvis Presley, the king of rock, right? And he says, sometimes I think I'm the most miserable person in the world. B.J. said that the guy that was doing the interview said, oh, come on now. You know that that's not true. That's not the case. You know that you're not the most miserable person in the world. He said, I am. (coughs) He said, sometimes I just think I'm the most miserable person in the world. B.J. said that when he preached that lesson, that he didn't know that there was some people that had been visiting that particular day, that Sunday, that were close kin to Elvis. And they were in that audience. And so he went and visited them, unbeknown to them, to him, that they were related to Elvis at the time. And in his visit, he said, the, the first thing that they told him was this. We have been out of church for many years, and it's, it's really interesting to us that at the first time that we come back, the preacher talks about... Ken talks about Elvis, our Ken. And they said, we were in that room when he was interviewed. We heard him say those very words. You see, Elvis would allow people, friends and family members to be a part of the interview as long as they didn't interrupt or get in the way. 
And they said, we were there that day. We heard Elvis make those statements. And they said that the person doing the interview continued trying to prompt him to say, look, you know you're not that miserable. There's no way you could be that miserable. There's no way that you could be that unhappy. He said Elvis didn't back back off at all. And I tell you that story because I want you to know that just because you have things, just because you have power, just because you're great and you have a name that that is known to all people, doesn't mean that you can be happy. It doesn't mean that you're going to be satisfied and content with life as it is. That's why Solomon said, therefore, I hated life. Look at all the things he had, yet he hated life. Now turn with me, if you will, to chapter 12, very quickly, of Ecclesiastes. The grave futility of life without God, but there's the golden fortune of life with God. You see, Solomon in summation says, look, life's not about things. Oh, it took him a while to to finally come to that conclusion, that life's not about things. Did Solomon know what he was talking about? I think he did. There was this boy, this deep yearning within his heart. And so in chapter 12 and verse 13, Solomon writes, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, the word duty was not in the original. It was supplied by the translators. But this is the whole of man, he says. This is all of man. I think that is the essence of what he was saying. The essence of life is not what your achievements. It's not about your achievements, your accomplishments. It's not about your accolades. It's not about your acquisitions. If you're living for God, it's about living for God. Making Him the hub of your life, the focus of your life. He said, that's the whole of man. Verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You may be here even today or watching online. And it might be that you have been in search of happiness and content and satisfaction. You've been out in the world and you've tried what the world has to offer. You've been to a lesser extent in the very shoes of Solomon, if you will. And you've tried it all. And in your conclusion, you know what? There's something missing, isn't there? You're not as happy as you thought you would be. Something's just not right in your life. Let me tell you what that something is. If it's a life without God, you'll never be happy without God in your life. You never will. There are a lot of folks in our world today that have it all like Solomon. They have it all, but they don't have anything. They have nothing without God. Oh, it's hard to understand, isn't it? You see, there's some people that that have everything this world has to offer, but they don't have anything without a relationship with God. There is an abundant life. There is a life offered by God that's unmatched. It's unparalleled. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10 You can have that abundant life. You, you talk about living a life that's, that is gold. You, you talk about living a life that is, that is filled with satisfaction and contentment and, and, and really peace and harmony. It's the Christian life. It's the Christian life. Greatest life there is, bar none. There is nothing this world has to offer that can rival your relationship to God. You can be blessed Now, and you can be blessed beyond the grave. But I ask you, are you grateful? Are you grateful? It might be the case that you're watching even online 
today, this morning, and you understand the love of God, and you appreciate that. It might be that you can comprehend the longing of God, that you haven't made God's longing a part of your life. It might be that, that you understand and you're grateful for the life that's been extended by the Lord Jesus Christ. You're grateful that your family members have tapped into that life, but you haven't. I want to encourage you. I want you to be encouraged to, to make it real in your life and to even do that even today today. I know that this year is just about over. But why not close out this year, 2020, with all the bad things that's been happening? Let's do something good by having a close relationship with God by obedience to the very gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope that you'll make that decision even today. If only you will call us, write us, text us, let us know. We will do all that we can to help you, to assist you in every way. By your faith and believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, by the repentance of your sins, turning away from those things that you've been doing wrong for all this time, to start doing things right. Make that good confession of the sweet name of Jesus. Be baptized in that watery grave for the remission of us. When you come up out of the waters of baptism, and I've seen it many times. I've seen the smiles on the, those people's face. I've seen how relieved and, and uh, uh, it seemed like a, a, just a world of peace has come over them that I'm now a, a Christian. I'm a child of God. I can now go out and teach others the same thing because I want them to experience what I've experienced. Go back and think about yours and what you did. And if you haven't done it, let us help you to see and feel that happiness, that peace, that harmony by obedience to the gospel. If you're a child of God and you've wandered away, repent of that. Pray that God will forgive you. The, the second law of pardon, the blood of Jesus Christ, continues to cleanse us as long as we repent of that and pray that God will forgive you. We hope that you'll make that decision even today.